but now we have it. We, we are now going to record Lisi's talk. So if you are if you are in hiding from federal agencies, this is your moment to turn off your camera. <laughs> right. And today is Wednesday, May 19th, 2020. And this is a presentation by the Waterford Historical Society with Lisi Moran, historical consultant. In, in 2021. Excuse me, May 19th, 2021. Good catch. Good. <laughs> Onward. <laughs> Lisi, is now okay. the platform is yours. All right, next step is, should I double click on the Zoom presentation and then share? I, or sh should I, I haven't done this except for share screen. I did not know there was a Zoom presentation button. Whatever okay. you try, we'll, we'll manage. All right, let's see if this works. Let's see if I do this first, sorry about that. Ooh. Nice. All right. Okay, now I've got to find my, um, I'm sorry, I've got to go back to where the screen is. Um, let's see. Okay, wait a minute. Sorry, I've just got to get my PowerPoint back. I I think, Lisa, you don't want Zoom presentation. You just want share screen. Okay. Because right. Zoom presentation is opening a separate meeting for you. Okay. So do share and then th there's the PowerPoint. Oh, there it is. There oh, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Helen, so much for the wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Good evening. In celebration of National Historic Preservation Month, it is a wonderful time to look at the history and style of one of your local landmarks. The former owners of the Cup House, Ed and Linda Mitchell of 6888 Route 18 in Lower Waterford, wish to have their house documented. This house was first inventoried by Alan D. Hodgson in 1980. And that was for the historic sites and surveys which was a survey of Caledonia County. It was once referred to by its original formal name as the quote unquote Whittemore Place. And now its formal name is the Cutler House. 35 individual properties were recognized in this survey and the Lower Waterford Historic District was created, which included 17 properties in the town of Waterford. On September 24th, 2020, this house was entered in the Vermont State of Historic Places, eligible under architecture and its integrity of workmanship. The state register nomination is important and the division states, quote, identifying and documenting significant historic and prehistoric resources throughout Vermont is one of the responsibilities of the Vermont Division of Historic Preservation. Resulting inventories allow the division to assist local governments and property owners in planning for the preservation, interpretation, and promotion of these resources." End of quote. The Vermont survey map of Cary and Doolittle in 1814 is a good slide to help to orient oneself on the location of Waterford in relation to the Connecticut River. Waterford is in the upper right yellow section about halfway down the map on the banks of the Connecticut River. And it's marked by three distinct protruding points of land. It's right here if you see it. And also is marked on the side by 15 Mile Falls on the shoreline. Waterford was listed as Littleton when this map was made, but a few years earlier in 1797, Waterford had been named the town instead of Littleton as not to confuse people with Littleton, New Hampshire, which was so nearby. There we go. Oh, right. The Waterford map, H.F. Walling of 1858 is a good place to show you exactly where sure. Lyndon Ed's house was, is, and it's there where I've pointed the arrow. This map illustrates Route 18. At this time, the house was owned jointly by Ezekiel Cutler, Rebecca Bronsden Cutler, 
and his son, Thomas Adkins Cutler, from his first marriage, who was the home boy. Well, the it's, total it's, acreage amounted to 310 acres on both sides of the road. The Dewey family, the Cutler family, and the Kinney families all had the most impact upon the house and lands. The Nathan Dewey descendants include Rear Admiral of the United States Navy, George Dewey of the Battle of Manila Bay, Melville Dewey, the father of the Dewey Decimal System, and lastly, Thomas E. Dewey, the former governor of New York. Oh, Thomas E. Dewey. <laughs> the hubby map, which is shown on your slide, is 1820. And this is a lot and range map that helps you to get oriented as to exactly how many parcels of land make up the acreage of the 310. And it's just about right in this area, if you put them all together. There was a lot in 14 ministerial, 15 Monson, 28 Goss, 31 Leonard, 32 Grampton, 45 Woodward, and lastly, 46 Palmer, roughly 33 acres. But if you total that up, it's 231 of those, but 100 acres were purchased later on. These were proprietorships. Buying land was highly speculative. And though a purchaser was supposed to clear the land and build a dwelling within a few years, often it was not the case. Taxes were often unpaid and there were subsequent tax sales. Patterns of migration to this area resulted from the promise of good alluvial soil and plenty of land, possibly from tax sales. The Royalston, Massachusetts families of the Pikes, the Hutchinsons, the Hemingways, the Knights, and the Cutlers all hailed from this town in northern Worcester County, Massachusetts, and even to other towns, Athol, where the graves came from, and Ashburnham, where the Hastings family came from as well. Here is a very modern shot of the northern elevation of the Mitchell's house. This house is a fine example of a circa 1845 rural vernacular Greek revival style house in the classic cottage variation. The Greek Revival style from 1825 to 1860 evolved into a national style throughout the United States. It was easily employed by craftsmen and master builders who could benefit from widespread pattern books. The American people reacted greatly to the Greeks who were fighting against the Turks and gave their sympathy having fought their own war of independence from Britain. Our architecture began to reflect the ideas of Greek independence and democracy. Furthermore, Americans wanted their own architectural style, not of British origin. Temple fronts, a triangular pentiment, an entablature, and a symmetrical arrangement of rooms, windows, and doors stems from this classical Greek order. White houses were meant to resemble marble, thus denoting purity. In general, Vermont received architectural trends later than areas near the Eastern seaboards and the lower Connecticut Valley. Vermont put its own variation upon this style as some, but not all of the characteristics are employed. The classic um, sentence I would say that explains this is from Historic New England's website, quote, Grecian doorways, moldings, window frames suggest the broad appeal of a style that represented a distant and idealized culture, end of quote. These are the four modern elevations of the house. The first slide in the upper left, from a three quarter view, we see the simpler Vermont style of corner boards instead of pilasters. We see a boxed cornice and then just cornice returns, not a cornice going all the way across as some other houses might have had. Also, you can see the doorway is flanked by two side light glass panels and an overhead, overhead transom, which has a nice tablet, um, which is where the letters or the house number 6888 is. And that's a very Greek revival thing. Also, the windows have a double bead on the top of decoration 
which adds a little more flair and glamour to the house. The eastern elevation below is a good place to show you the overhanging it's, it's an eave that comes out a little bit at you. And also the symmetry, one, three, five. And you have everything in order. It's to divide the house. Also, I want you to see it's, it's, it's got a, a sheathing of wood and it also has a foundation of cut stone. The Western elevation is exactly like the Eastern. It has the same triple window, which has the side lights on either side. It's double hung, six panes, six panes. It has the three, and instead of the doorway here, it has the five windows. Three of the windows are original, as Linda employed uh, Sally Fishburne of Danville, Vermont, to reconstruct and um, get the windows back in shape. Also, you can see the finished porch, which was once open where the, fam the Whittemore family did their laundry and hung it, but now they're floor to ceiling windows. And um, it, it just is very nice because it completes the house and adds another room. The Southern elevation in this last photo shows you the dormer that was built after the big fire that happened at the Whittemore house. These are bedrooms with a bathroom flanking the two. And again, the floor to ceiling windows also the attic. The attic was finished and it's in a tray design. You might also see the chimneys. The chimneys are in the back roof slope so as not to get in the way of the pretty Greek Revival front. Greek Revival means we want to see the front, the temple. We don't want to get confused so we'll put them on the back and that's why they were constructed there. These two older photos, probably around circa 1947, were taken when the Whittemores lived there. The top photo shows you the roof of medium pitch, which is another Greek revival detail. It shows you the porch that was once there um, and was taken off in 1987 by Eric Charlton. And also, I want your eye to look at the stone embankments here, which were put in after Route 18 was improved and widened. You'll also see that the picket fence um, wasn't yet constructed there. In the second, you will see this building wing, which is the summer kitchen for storage. That was burned, sadly, in the fire. And now the garage footprint is right in that place. That's where it is. I also want you to know the house is larger than some cottages. It's 4,374 square feet with the four by five, again, the five bays I told you about. And that's another Greek revival character finding feature. Okay, is this all right. Um, it's not going ahead here. Let's see. Oh. Granite posts, the interior. The cellar maintains a temperature of 40 degrees most of the year. This slide depicts the roughly cut granite posts set upon the dirt and gravel floor. These cellar posts support the hand-sawn floor joists of the first floor. There is evidence of marks on the joist showing up and down circular saw marks as opposed to, I'm sorry, excuse me, up and down reciprocating saw marks as opposed to later period homes after 1840 when the technology changed and the circular saw was important and shown in more houses. The wine cupboard. This wine cupboard is displayed in the living room and has a distinctive set of corner blocks and moldings. And another house in Norwich, Vermont also had a wine cellar cupboard, excuse me, but it wasn't as Greek revival. It was much more a carryover of the Palladian federal style. Other beautiful embellishments in this room include panels underneath the windows and nine inch 
baseboards. And even above the ceiling, there is a gorgeous circular centerpiece or rosette near the lighting fixture. Stairway with wave pattern. Another interior decorative feature is the elegant single run flight of stairs with square balusters, which support the thin handrail. The black newel post is more elongated and less convex. This is a good dating measure for dating a house as 1830s newel posts were not as fat as the 1851s became. The right side, the right slide is the wave pattern, which is the, in the carriage of the stairway. This is also a good time to mention that the bathroom was put in in this area. This is a central hallway going back to the rear of the house. But when the bathroom went in, it truncated it, making two different spaces. Another very important construction feature here is to tell you that the walls were plank framed from a half an inch to four inches thick. This palisade style of vertical membering was used for interior sheeting, sheathing in place of braces and studs. Towns in the Northeast Kingdom in particular had this method of construction for stability and most likely for installation as well. Barn complex industry. Two barns, a silo, and the summer kitchen wing all tragically burned September 13, 1964. This helps to illustrate the evolving nature of agriculture on this property, starting with subsistence farming, field crops, uh, raising hogs, chickens, sheep, and steers, to dairying and maple sugaring, and finally to growing vegetables and flowers in the later years. We know from various historical records that Willard Kinney, who lived here roughly from 1866 to 1890, took his sheep, hogs, and cattle to the Brighton Stock Market in Cambridge, Mass. We also know that Charles Luther Hemingway, an owner from 1930 to 1944, was listed in the American Shorthorn Index as a sheep and cattle raiser. Merino sheep and sheep houses. The story of this house couldn't be told without mentioning the Vermont sheep boom. Pictured in the slide is a typical Merino sheep. This breed was popular due to its water resistant wool, its ability to graze on rocky hillsides and eat a variety of foodstuffs and be sheared only twice yearly. In 1840, Waterford had 1,383 people, 2,573 cattle, but had 7,341 sheep, amassing 12,032 pounds of wool. As a result of this booming industry, sheep houses were constructed that were larger. Town historian Eugenia Powers said of the Brown House in the 1981 annual town report, quote, the two-story front part of this house built somewhat later probably should be considered a quote unquote sheep house. This term is used to refer to larger dwellings constructed in the prosperous days of sheep raising, end of quote. Tourist guest houses. The Brown house, by the way, is right here below the Cutler house on room 19. With the advent of better roads and more mobility after World War II, Fresh air and a nice table made people take to motoring. The choice of staying in a comfortable tourist home with homemade meals became an affordable option to a more expensive inn or resort hotel. Owner Ed Spears operated a tourist home named Maplehurst Farm as shown in the upper slide. A few years later, when the Whittemore family purchased the property, they continued to run a guest house, but with the addition of quote unquote, excellent food served as shown on the signpost. Here. Eventually a Texaco gas station and the countryside restaurant were constructed across the street. Contours of the land. The top postcard shows a scenic view of the meandering Connecticut River from around the 1950s, right outside of the countryside restaurant. The bottom photo, circa 1990, proves that almost nothing has changed this exact viewpoint. Contact Magazine. When the Samuel C. Moore Dam was constructed, there was an employee magazine called Contact of the New England Electric Company. 
And Alfred K. Schroeder took a picture and it was inserted in the upper left corner and magnified a little lower right corner. This photo won a Northeast Council Award and a national ad campaign. This slide is shown to show just how close and visible the Cutler House is to the dam and the village on Maple and Main Street, all seemingly in concert with one another. And Linda's house is right here. You can see the barns. American Cyanamid's ad entitled The Light of Christmas. This slide is important because the American Cyanamid Company of 30 Rockefeller Center, New York, New York, also chose the same vantage point to take a picture of Lower Waterford Village. Cutler House is visible in the upper left-hand corner. This ad ran, ran from December 2nd to the 14th of December in Time, Newsweek, Business Week, and the Saturday Evening Post magazines. Barbara Douse remembered well that the family was instructed by the photographer to make sure that the house was well illuminated that night. Arthur Griffin, another local photographer, took this just at dusk from the same exact viewpoint. It is undated, but a Ford Thunderbird is parked on Maple Street and the Texaco sign is sticking up across from the Cutler house. There's your <laughs> Thunderbird. Popular postcards. Again, the same vantage point. Two separate well-known postcards depict this wonderful scene. These cards help to show that Route 18 in the left-hand corner is a Connecticut River Vermont byway. One can discover historic villages, arts and culture, commerce and recreation highlighted on these routes. One can also pass by the Cutler House on the way to the Connecticut River on the byway, which is right. This is the road, Route 18. Historic House Fundraiser. A joint fundraiser which benefited both the Congregational Church of Waterford and the Waterford Historical Society archives took place on June 20th, 2015. This was a wonderful idea that benefited two great Waterford historic resources. And Linda's garden was on that tour amongst some other very pretty Waterford houses. Conclusion. In the final analysis, if Thomas Adkins Cutler returned to Lower Waterford in the present time, he would indeed be able to recognize his home, former home. Documenting your house can benefit you, your house, your neighborhood, your town, your county, and your state. A link with a three-page handout has been attached to the invitation with the Zoom instructions. It shows where you can get this information, your library and town office vault, are a great place to start your research. Maps, postcards, deeds, gazetteers, and town histories are very beneficial. I wish to thank Linda and Ed Mitchell, Beth Cannell, Dave Morrison, Kate Piper, and the late Barbara Whittemore Douse for their amazing support in this project. Thank you. This is remarkable. Thank you so much. I, I can't believe how much I learned when I thought I knew Waterford Village. <laughs> <We're> Waterford Village. <laughs> okay. There. Now I've stopped share. So now we're all in gallery view. <laughs> Great. Um, if you would like to raise your hand with a question, I'll I'll unmute you, or you can unmute yourself and you can ask a question with your voice. Uh, but Ann Foss had had specifically asked Lisa where the barn is, and I thought part of it was still there. Is it? No. I'm sorry to tell you, it is not. Okay. The barns, there were two barns, a silo and the summer kitchen wing. Mm. And that all came down September in that September date that I told you in 1964. And the house might have been affected had the winds not changed at the last minute. Wow. So, it, so the barn was on that side of the, uh, where the house was, not, not yeah. anywhere else. And it was yeah, the barn was lower. Let's say it's toward the Connecticut River. In other words, going toward the Brown House. In other words, beyond the garage, right beyond going down the hill toward uh, the Connecticut, toward the Brown House okay. and the Aldrich's house. What a beautiful barn. What a shame. Oh, it's so sad. And Linda did tell me that the stoop 
of the doorway when I showed you the elevation, the eastern elevation, for some reason it wasn't lined up the way it is now. It was much more toward a nook area. And the fire came right to that point, but luckily they were able to extinguish it. But of course, they did have to put a new window in and change the doorway. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there was a dairy shed, by the way, which was closer to the road. Um, I don't know exactly if it came down with the fire or at another date, but it was when that law changed, the dairy must be in a separate, it was a health condition. So dairy house had to be erected so that that dairy milk was separate from other things in the barn. Sanitary. Sanitary, thank you. <laughs> Very. Yeah. How long did it take for you uh, across months to gather all this material? Yes, it did. Uh, one of the problems was I have a summer home that I live in. I'm not in it right this minute, but it's not open yet. The problem is it was built um, for my grandparents. It's not winterized. So I, I stayed with friends in Sugar Hill. I stayed with friends, um, Linda and Ed. Um, and I tried to do as much as I could from the month of May until October when I was physically here. That's so, remarkable. I'd say maybe two years, but it was partly because I was elsewhere for six months in the middle. Thank you. And, and Claire would like confirmation on the year that the house was built? Yes, it is circa 1845. And circa always gives you five years on either side of the construction date. So 1840, 1850. But I think based on the Newell Post, the balusters, um, the up and down saw marks, the nails that we found, which were more square as opposed to a round or a wire nail, they all give you clues as to when something was built. And Jim Garvin, by the way, who was a wonderful man, who was the architectural historian in the state of New Hampshire, and he worked at the Division of Historical Resources in um, Concord, wrote a book. And he, he'll show you profiles and it really helps to date your house. When you look at the saw marks, look at the door hardware, look at the nails, uh, it really gives you an idea of when something was constructed. Vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, circa like five years on either side. Mm -hmm. So were square nails uh, created by uh, blacksmiths? Yes, they were. Yes, okay, so like the rose headed, you've heard of all of those. They're, they're very long, long and kind of um, curl over a little bit. They're not the way our nails are today. You can tell that they were handcrafted. Yeah. Okay. And they say nail tech, the nails had a technology the way the up and down saw did. It's, it's like 1840. It's just almost like a point right there before and after. Mm -hmm. And one thing again, Vermont um, craftsmen took the place of architects. They were very able, they could use hand saws. There was mill work that was coming in. There were booklets you could use. Um, they were very able, they could do mason work. They could do all sorts of different projects. They were very able, very ambidextrous. It, it was wonderful. Can I ask a quick question right here, Lisi? Were the nails, do you think that they came from the blacksmith shop in Lower Waterford? I don't know. I have some pictures that I took. Linda saved some nails, luckily, and mm -hmm. let me take pictures of them. And I took them to my iPhone, yeah. which is really nice to have because I can send them to you or I can show them or she can show you. And that's a good thing. That's a good diagnostic tool. Dave, have you seen these nails? Dave Morrison? Oh, wait, wait, we have to unmute you. No, I haven't, Helen. Okay. Would you like to see a picture of them to see if they match up with anything you have from your grandfather's blacksmith shop? Well, we'll leave grandpa out of this because he, he was way, way too in the future when this house was built. Okay. But that there could have been a blacksmith shop there in the, in the brook bed uh, operated by previous or former uh, blacksmiths. One thing I did read over and over again that 
a lot of the workmanship came from local sources, local people, the local mills, uh, and people shared their their expertise and, and helped you, again, the barn raising. But also, which I didn't mention, I didn't have time to, there were some marriages of next door neighbors. Eliza Kinney married one of the Browns. Um, so you had everything happening in a closer range. And, you know, by getting in the crops, you know, you just ask your friends to help and you needed to have wood. Well, you, you just would either have wood from your own property or you would have bricks that came from a kiln nearby. It was so localized. So these craftsmen, they were structural engineers. They were, yes, they were so, they, they're unsung heroes. We think of today, oh, you need an architect. Well, in these days, your local craftsman could do many, many parts of the house himself. And again, wood was so plentiful. That's why there was wood, wood for millwork, wood for the, and the plank house was very, um, well, both the plank house construction and the granite posts really impressed our, your architectural historian in the state of Vermont, Del, Devin Coleman. He just loved, loved knowing both those things. And it gives the house a lot of um, stature. Beautiful. There, there is a technology called the mobile sawmill that came along through the area at some point, and that would have diversified where people could get their wood. Does anybody in the group have any idea when that came through? Okay, well, well Claire, that, David, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, at the time that house was built, your only sawmills would have had to been run by water power, so. Uh, the the uh, mobile mills that we have now are dependent on some kind of a gasoline or maybe even diesel engine. Thanks, good point. Right, but you did, I think the mobile mills, there was something called a pony mill and that was the um, energy for these portable mills. They were like on a treadmill. And the, and- With the horse? The horse, yep. And that, and that would saw the lumber in the end, I think there's a photograph we have somewhere in our archives of such a contraption on, um, on the Carpenter Place up on Maple Street. Great, so Claire, who asked the question on that, um, let mm -hmm. us get back to you, Claire, about what the date of that Carpenter Pony Mill photo was, and we'll see if we can narrow that down a little bit. Thank you. And there was the mill in Littleton, right? A and Far Company. Wasn't that water from the Amanusik run by? Well, we had closer mills than that, I think, because the Copenhagen district had its own mill. Um, and there Upper was a, Waterford had its own mill. Upper Waterford had a mill, and then there was another uh, at the Upper Waterford edge of Concord, right? Well, that's what I'm thinking. Of. Okay. Okay. So that would be um, near, is it called Grist Mill? Pit? Yeah, it's an awful name. Yeah. Grist Mill Pit Road. It would have been, it, so it's um, a small stream that comes out of Shadow Lake and eventually empties into the Connecticut River. So there's the force of that water coming down and there was a grist mill slash lumber mill that was there that was in operation, I think even through the 1940s. Hmm. I remember um, talking to Fred Bullock about that mill. My family owned it and he worked for my great uncle and that's the circle of life. Um, <laughs> and how you try to, con how you find the dots and then how you try to connect the dots to tell the story. But um, this pony mill, I know that um, in the logging camps, you'd, you could use horses in this way to generate the energy if you were on a flat plain or if you were too far away from water and you needed, for whatever the reason was, to, to mill lumber um, as opposed to hauling out the logs. Not sure. And I hope I'm right in my memory about this photograph. But it's a pretty distinctive photograph at the Carpenter Place. And I don't, there, there's a question also from Claire on whether pony mills had circular saws. I would think circular saws would actually come earlier than reciprocating saws. Yeah, I would think so. Because you're, you're generating, with the treadmill, you're generating a rotating power. And rough logs did better with the up and down 
saw I've read a few times. I mean, the earlier the lo the logs for the the timber for the house, the the up and down did better with it. That's what I've read a few times. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. As opposed to uh, now, it is true. Mildred Bullock married a Hemingway. Is isn't that correct? Uh, Mildred Bullock sounds right, but I'm not sure about the Hemingway. That'll have to come from your from you for that. Okay, I was just curious because um, I know she was a librarian for you. She she was a librarian, and I think she was also a town officer. But it, it was just wonderful to see all the the relationships, like Lyman Fisher Dewey, who again was related to Nathan Dewey, who was one of the early um, purchasers of land, who lived at the White <coughs> Farm. So you have so many relationships, so many marriages. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing um, study when you look at um, where the families came from and who married one another. Yeah, Lise. Yeah. yeah. It was Roy Hemingway. Oh, thank, thank you very much, David. Thank you. And in general, we we find the Bullock family, which was in Lindenville before Waterford. We find many people in the Bullock family who developed skills in working with wood, whether it was through a mill or designing a barn or carpentry. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Lacey, I should ask, uh, are you in business doing this as a consultant, would people be able to reach out to you? Yes, they would, absolutely. I'd be very happy to help them. Um, I have a small project in Little, excuse me, well, it's actually in Bethlehem, um, but it's not gonna be, <laughs> it's not gonna be as, as intense, as, or I should say as extensive as this one was because it's a smaller house and, and the people just want a few things. But I would be very happy to assist anyone um, to show them where the information is, tell them how to do it, eat, put it on the state register, or if the house is, is very, very, very high styled, um, for example, your beautiful congregational church was put on the national register and your Lee Farm complex was on the national register, again, because it's so pure and it's such a fine example without too many changes to the character defining features. So, you know, any of those things um, I could try to help you with. Wonderful. And of course, we're eager to help at the Waterford Historical Society. We're building an archive that grows almost daily. Um, we have lots of resources, lots of photos. Occasionally, we'll have to say, well, we'll look that up and get back to you. But we'd love to have you all come to meetings and, and take part and, and look at the questions we're all asking and ask your own. Yes, so if any of you want to be put on our email list, please send us an email through the, our blog and we can add you to the list and you'll get our monthly mailings of what we're doing and where we're meeting. Um, in fact, our next big event is our rhubarb festival on June 19th, just to give it a plug. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> great. I'm so happy that slide was put at the end. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, rhubarb lives. We'll be doing it at the White Birch Farm, which is a a noteworthy historic property here in Waterford and it's at the other end of town near the St. Johnsbury line. It's where Route 18 and the Interstate 91 connect and it'll be from 11 a.m. till 2 p.m. And you'll want to send us your email because we're doing pre-orders and pre-sales. And we're pretty sure this stuff is gonna sell out because we're mighty fine bakers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so uh, if you want, to purchase one of our delectable treats, please reach out to us and let us know. You can find our blog easily by typing into your Google search bar, Waterford, Vermont History, and it will come right up. But we're also on Facebook and both Helen and I, because we're authors, you can find us easily by typing us into the Google search bar as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're, we're, we're not in any witness relocation program. <laughs> <laughs> that you know of. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and Lisey's information is on the blog and we'll repeat that. So if you want to reach out to Lisey, we're eager to have you do that also. Yeah. Thanks. Well, this was a, this was a great uh, event for our first ever Zoom program and perhaps we might do this again. We might indeed, especially in winter. 
Yes. We have been a small historical society that didn't have meetings in winter because so many of our members are, are not very happy about sliding on snow and ice, but with <laughs> Zoom, maybe we'll have them year round. So if you have an idea, uh, again, a, a special question, let us know and we'll look into maybe setting up a meeting around that, that theme. Yes, a program. A, a program. The, we, the directors yeah. meet, you, together we have programs where we have fun. <laughs> very true. <laughs> And we laugh a lot. Yes, we do. I, I personally would absolutely love to know about the wood. I mean, I know, Helen, you, you have a lot to do with wood. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's sort of, you know, where you get the wood, how you fix it so that you can work with it. And then how you work with it. I mean, that's, that's really interesting. I think that's a great idea, Claire. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it, go, it comes out of this preservation side. How did they do it? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Big, they didn't have huge trucks. They had a bunch of horses. Rivers, rivers. <laughs> and, and oxen, yes. and oxen. Yeah, good. Yeah. We'll follow up on that. Thank you, appreciate it. I, I'll look forward to it. Um, I, I'm going to be away, so I'm going to miss your rhubarb, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well if you if you're really nice maybe we'll save you a little taste yes <laughs> there might be one dessert we could freeze for you yes. we'll, we'll have another surprise for for um june 19th that'll be available uh-huh all right more to come more to come it's good all thing right. you're on our email list claire <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And thank you again, Lisi. We appreciate this very, very much. And thank you, Linda and Ed, for hooking us up and sharing <laughs> your home with us. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, all of you. This is lovely. I appreciate your interest. It's, it's great for historic preservation, too. Great. I, and I hope we're going to get your, we're going to have your slides because I need to look at them with a, you know, I need to expand. Go to the, in the email, there is the link to Lisi's document. It's about yeah. 63 pages and it's illustrated. It has the maps, it has the photographs, and it has all of her, re the narrative is all laid out and it's footnoted and there's a, it's not an index, what do you call it at the end of the, your 63 pages? All her sources, um, the town reports, the Caledonian record, it's all listed there. So that link in the email will take you to Lisi's document for the Cutler House. Good, Good reading. All right. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Good night, Lise. Good night. Thank you, David, for all your help. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And Linda and Ed, a big thank you to you. And yeah. thank you, Beth and Helen. Thank you. <laughs> Our pleasure.